G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. We'll have all the show notes and any resources mentioned in the cast on our website. At the end of high school in 2005, a great teacher pushed her to end a business plan competition. She went on to win the Australasian Award. Aged 19 in 2007, she started a law degree part-time and launched her dog daycare walking and sitting business. There were only two other dog daycare businesses in Australia at the time. They walk up to 50 dogs at a time and take them to unusual locations like Federal Parliament and the War Memorial. Rhiannon clearly has a passion for dog wellness. The business has grown every year on average at 180% from herself, the 1FTE, to now 29. When she launched the business, the industry was worth $3.8 billion per annum in Australia and now it is at $12 billion. In 2017, bought another salon 30 kilometres away. Two years later, closed it and brought 98% of the customers to headquarters. End of 2008, got a $10,000 loan for a few months from her father to replace her 1982 small car, the only finance she's had. Late 2013, had burnout, which led to infection on her brain. Took six months to recover, but the best thing that ever happened. She had to let go, trust the team and let them run it. Felt she'd succeeded when achieved work-life balance and feedback from clients. Hardest thing about growing a small business is sacrifices you make and letting go. What Rhiannon would tell herself on day one of starting out is set systems and procedures up to where you want to be, not where you are now. Go back and listen to episode eight, where Sam Reed talks about co-founding Willie Smith's in 2013. Now Australia's leading organic cider and went from 2FTE to 25. Welcome everyone. Today I'm interviewing Rhiannon Beach from Pups for Fun in Canberra ACT, just uh, east of Sydney, Australia. Thanks for your time this, this morning, Rhiannon. Thanks, Joey. Thanks for having me part of your podcast. No worries. And we know each other. Peter, our podcast editor, reached out because he's got a mission to help me balance up the male to female ratio on the cast, 50-50. So we're getting there and thanks for coming on. No worries. Absolute pleasure. So tell our audience a bit about your business, what it does and how it makes money. Yep. So um, I run a dog daycare, dog grooming, dog walking um, centre in Canberra. We care for about 500 dogs per week, um, providing them with dog walking, dog grooming and dog daycare services. Um, Our daycare service is quite unique from most other daycares in Australia um, as we go out and about. So we don't just um, go to a facility and spend a day there. Uh, We tend to take them to many different places, um, some including Parliament House, the uh, War Memorial, Um, the High Court, the National Library. Um, And the reason we do that is mainly to um, encourage the dogs to be good um, social citizens, get them out, get them around people um, and and practising their manners. And and, and improving their political... um, (laughs) (laughs) We try not to get too political sometimes, (laughs) but, you know, there has been um, some photos. We're we're well known for our uh, big lineups of around 50 dogs in front of these iconic sort of places. Yeah, I was going to ask, how many dogs do you take out at a time, up to 50? It just depends, yeah. It it really does depend on the group, the size, the the staff. Um, But we have taken, yeah, up to 50. Sometimes we like to keep it at, like, the 25. Um, It just really depends on on the day and the dogs and what we're trying to achieve too. Yep. So, Great. yeah. So our mission is um, to better the lives of dogs and to help um, clients have that support when they're getting dogs. So a lot of um, people are having dogs instead of children. Um, so we really want to support uh, that sort of lifestyle and being able to um, encourage what dogs need for wellness, physical and mental stimulation. Yeah, it's a massive growth industry, pet, like pet insurance, pet food, pet stores mm. in the last 10 years have yeah. just skyrocketed. So I think you're yeah. in a good sector. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, and I'm a big advocate with my chocolate Labrador Carlton supporter. Although yeah. when, we, when we go bushwalking and he finds a dead wallaby, he's not, he's not my favourite thing in the world. But. Yeah, yeah. I had a bee that used to roll in the dead kangaroos all the time and he was so proud of himself so you <laughs> could never be upset about it. I know. They've got this big smile. They're so happy. Look what I've done, Dad. And it's yeah. like, right, we're having a bath. <laughs> um, and um, so tell us how you started out. So I started out um, in 2008. Um, I 
the reason I started out, I was in year 11 and I was part of a business class. And for that business class, I had to write a business plan. I had no idea about business or what I would even like to do in business. Um, but as I used to walk to and from school, I used to see all these dogs in their backyards barking lonely. And I thought, all right, well, let's just have this idea of making a dog daycare similar to a children's crèche. Um, obviously, in this day and age, it's not that strange. Um, but when I started in 2008, there was about two facilities in all of Australia. So wow. at that time it was, um, and they'd only just sort of started that year, one in Richmond, I think possibly one in um, Brisbane. So um, it was a very new concept. It was a very um, come from America. And so it was a little strange. <laughs> yep. um, but yeah, so I did the assignment. Uh, my teacher was very impressed, so decided to enter me in the 2005 Plan Your and Enterprise competition, uh, which I ended up against my will agreeing to enter <laughs> um, and ended up winning the state competition and then going on to win Australasia. Congratulations, so, that's amazing. I, Thanks. Yeah. So it was kind of, that was a, with the support of my teacher and also, um, I guess a bit of validation winning, um, a big, big competition like that. I thought, well, let's just, once I finished school, I thought, let's have a, have a crack, see how it goes. So in 2008, in uh, January, I enrolled in a uh, university doing a bachelor of laws and also on the same day started uh, my business. Yep. So, um, I had been working about seven hours a week in a coffee shop. It's my only other job I've ever had in my life. So I was saving my money. Um, and then, yeah, in, the, in 2008, took the big leap. And so I started off walking just a couple of dogs in the neighbourhood mm -hmm. and then slowly progressed from uh, there, brought on my first employee, who was my brother, who's three years younger than me and obviously didn't really like being told what to do by his <laughs> big sister, yep. but um, was a big part of uh, the, the beginning and the growth. Um, because he was such a great dog handler yeah. and, and really, you know, understood my vision and dream as well. So although my business plan was for kind of where I'm at today, uh, I had to start somewhere because yes. of my age and uh, lack of uh, finance and capital at that yep. stage. <laughs> and so did you go on to complete your law degree? Yeah, I did. I completed that. It took me eight years, um, yep. but I completed that in 2016. So... Um, that was interesting growing a business and doing a law degree at the same time has been something that was an extreme challenge, but something I'm very proud of. So yep. yeah, yeah great. And what age were you in 2008 when you kicked off the business? I was just 19. So yep. yep. I had, uh, I'd sort of, when I was 18, I knew I was going to start, but I took a year to tr try and um, did a small business management course uh, I did a bit of coffee shop shifts to save some money and then, yeah, started. And it's funny, I only just found, I was clearing out some paperwork and found my very first invoice on <laughs> the 17th of January in 2008 uh, for a dog walk for $10. <laughs> so, <laughs> there you go. You do have yeah. to start somewhere. Journey, yeah. of a thousand, journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step, doesn't it? Or the first, first invoice. <laughs> well, the, and then it's funny, once I did that first walk, I decided that uh, from my second service, I would triple my prices. So my <laughs> second invoice went straight up to $30 yep. uh, because I really valued my time and knew I was going to be able to balance university and business at the same time. I had to put that value in straight away. Geez, Rhiannon, it takes um, small business owners, particularly, for, it took me you know, it took three or four years to before you clue into pricing, getting your pricing right. So you did well after one invoice. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, Pricing is really important. That's an area that I um, have always stood really strong on. We've always had a higher end prestige price and a higher end prestige service. Yep. Um, and I've never been one to compromise on that because like I said, I value my time, my employees time and the business time. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess knowing that if I went into law, I'd be charging out at six minute intervals. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, so understanding that and the, and, and being able to use the motivation of growing a viable business means you have to charge yes. um, accordingly, which has been a challenge in this industry because it doesn't always work that way. And, and yeah. people you're competing with don't necessarily have the same overheads or the same value of time. Hmm. Um, but yeah, it's very important to consider, I think, pricing. 
Absolutely. I've got a subject matter expert coming on in the next few weeks on pricing. Mm. So Christoph from Simon and Kutcher, he's a partner in Sydney there. Okay. I think they're the world leading experts on pricing. They've got 1,400 staff. So that's going to wow. be a really interesting conversation. Um, yeah. Yeah, we had him at a, one of the monthly beer meetups here in Hobart on Zoom a few months ago talking about pricing and it was really well received. So yeah, yeah. listen out for that one. I will do, for sure. Do you have any key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth of the business? Yeah, so we've been in operation almost 13 years. Um, every year of the business there's been growth, um, even, you know, we started in 2008, which is global financial crisis, which wasn't, you would think, a great uh, year to start doing something that was the disposable income but I chose to do it anyway. Um, And yeah, every year we've had a growth um, with an average growth rate about 180%. Wow. Um, So uh, we've just, every year it's about, you know, finding new new stride, bettering our service and where we can sort of uh, make that growth. Uh, The pet industry sort of, as we were mentioning uh, before we started uh, recording was, you know, when I started in 2008, it was worth $3.4 billion. Um, in October last year, it's gone all the way up to $12.2 billion. So And that's in Australia? Just in Australia, yeah. Wow. Yep. So that's it. It's a, a rapid uh, growing business. So one of the reasons I've sort of taken on uh, this business and taken it really seriously is for many years, people would uh, would ask me what I did and uh, and I would explain and I'd tell them and they would say, oh, that's that's cute, you know, <laughs> like, uh, what, what do you do full time? And, and I would explain, you know, that not only is it my full time job, it's, you know, the full time job of uh, at the moment, 29 full time equivalent people and 36 staff. Um, and it's serious business. It's not just uh, a matter of being cute and, and fluffy and all that. Yep. It is serious business. So uh, one of my goals is to yeah create credibility for uh, other people in the pet industry so people yep. understand that it is it is serious business. That's phenomenal growth, Rhiannon. Well done. Yeah, thanks. So... Uh, it- have you only got the one site? Or, or, or Yes. So we did in uh, 2017, I did buy another grooming salon um, and we took over that quite quickly. That was um, really received rapid growth during that period. Um, we almost grew like 50, um, I think it was almost 200%. Um, so we took over that salon, which was great. It was an opportunity, another business friend of mine that needed to move into state. So we were able to take on lots more staff, lots more clients. Um, We were operating out of a uh, vet hospital and for that second salon and they needed to expand. So we either had to make the choice to go and take us that salon to a second location. So that was in Queanbeyan, New South Wales, just across the border. Yeah. Um, And we made the choice to amalgamate back all into one business. So move that business back to our prime location. And thank goodness we did. It has been absolutely amazing. Most of the clients have come over. We've grown, sustained the growth that we've picked up from acquiring that new business. Um, We were also really lucky to miss out on a few things, the bushfires and now with COVID. um, I Mm -hmm. think that would have caused a lot of... um, difficulty so you know I think we made really good choices when it came to that so it was a really good choice to to buy into that and take over and and fast pace that growth Um, and then yeah amalgamate it all back together. So you bought the salon and then soon after shut the site down and moved the business all the About two years yeah Yeah. so two years we got enough in to get our feet on the ground take that you know instant cash flow um, build the business, build the rapport with the clients and um, <clears throat> build that trust. Yep. And uh, for anyone that couldn't move across with us, because the location was quite um, significant for the travel. What's the um, distance just for the audience? Oh, roughly about 30 kilometres, and which is not massive, but in Canberra, all terms, in, Australia. <laughs> in Canberra terms, that's from, it's all the way east um, to all the way west was what we were asking our clients to travel, um, which... Most of them, you know, that wasn't an issue at all. It was only, you know, if they couldn't. So we were able to refer them to other local businesses. Um, But, yeah, so we were really impressed. We were happy if we kept 50% of our clients and 50% of the growth and we pretty much kept like 98. That's great. Yeah, we were really happy with that. So one site now, have you got, are you thinking about adding any other cities or sites down the track? Uh, at this stage, no. So we do have the one head office location, but we do work because we are itinerant. We do work off site. So uh, we do have a 
dog park, a, a purpose-built dog park that I've created, um, which is off-site. So that's where we run our daycare and everything there. Looked about going interstate um, and doing different things, but at this stage we have a really unique service and we have a really unique market because yep. we do take them out, um, which obviously is a bigger cost involved. So um, it's something that is potentially an option down the track. It's just not something that's probably in the next 12 to 18 months. Have you considered franchising? I've cons roughly considered franchising. <laughs> haven't taken a lot of look into it, but it's always something that I to and fro. Um, however, my opinion in order to sort of franchise and everything, you have to have everything pretty good as far as systems and procedures go and which we do we do have great systems and great procedures um, but being a service-based business people is the key so yep. trying to uh, manage that side of things I'm not saying it's impossible and it's not saying I'm sure if I have professionals to assist with that it's something that's definitely um, being considered that's for sure yeah, I think something will change your mind pretty quickly. Uh, next week, Tina Towers' cast goes live. It's late September 2020, mm. uh, and she's got a phenomenal story. I encourage you to listen to that and then also reach out to Tina and, and mention you've listened to the cast and you've, you've been on the cast. I think she will quickly change your mind. She uh, started a, she was a primary school teacher, started at age 20, started a um, after school tutoring service for primary school kids and had a physical store kids books and toys grew that to three stores and then after seven years of those three stores decided to franchise and got up to 35 franchisees mm. and sold out after starting you know thir 13 years after starting so age 33 she sold out and uh was very glad to get out of the franchising game basically wow mm. wow yeah i've heard some um i've had some experience with other franchisees and had some um really positive stories about that. So it's definitely something that is uh, <laughs> worth considering, looking at and chatting to. And like I said, going yeah. to the experts because I'm definitely not an expert yeah. in that field as it, of yet. <laughs> it can obviously work. There's, uh, you know, the... Uh, his name oh jim's mowing jim's everything mm, basically yeah he's done really well so it yeah. can can happen uh, yeah. it can be a success but uh i've heard mixed reports about whether it's worth considering mm. so like anything just talk with people that have done it and you know see see what you think absolutely and i guess the more that we can share um you know my goal and the vision of the business to be able to support as many owners and and dogs as possible around australia if it's if it's achieving that then it's always a good thing yep yeah and fantastic when was the moment you felt like you'd succeeded uh when i was able to achieve sort of work-life balance um i think you know everyone every business needs to make money um and as long as i'm sort of making money enough to be able to pay the bills and not be worried too much about that um but i've been able to sort of have work-life balance and work interstate um, and leave the business without it breaking and falling to pieces. So um, that from that point, I knew that I had a great team. Um, and also when the clients, you get that feedback that just makes it all worth it. Uh, you, they they respond to you, they understate, they explain to you how you've sort of almost changed their life in certain scenarios um, with, with the growth of clients. You know, I started with two or three a week. Now we're looking at around about 500 wow. um, per week. So, and, and really what's important to us is just because there's a number like 500 people, are, you know, that's a lot of numbers, but we, our biggest priority is to make sure that those people are all being treated like they were just one of four. Um, and so they're all very valued and, and we understand sort of the lifetime value of that customer. Yep. Um, and getting that feedback, you know, it was only this week, one of our clients rung up and said, oh, I'm, I'm just going to run, I'm running a little bit late because we have a bus that will leave, like, that goes on the excursions. So I'm, I'm running a bit late for the bus. I've had to go out to this really fancy uh, patisserie and grab you guys all pastries and coffees. So <laughs> nice. we, we definitely held out the bus and we get that sort of feedback all the time. They build things for us. They buy us gifts and they're really, they've really gotten behind um, the support. We went through some legislative changes in ACT and we're like, relation to animal welfare and our clients before we could even ask they jumped on board the same with COVID this year when things became quite tough our clients were there they had our back they believe in our dream they believe in our vision so I think once that's 
you start to see that you're like, okay, we're, we're on track. And I right. think success is, you know, it's, it's never ending. You, yep. you keep building on it. Um, but you know, when you get those places of being able to have that level of customer satisfaction, your staff are happy and you've got work life balance, uh, and you can pay your bills. Mm-hmm. What, more, what more can you want? <laughs> yeah. Well, that was the next question. What does success look like to you? Yeah. And that's yeah. pretty much it. You know, finding that balance, being able to do all those things um, and, you know, still being able to grow personally and yep. I think in, and, and in the business. It sounds like you've got a really engaging customer base. Um, do you have any metrics on their satisfaction and loyalty? Yeah, so quite often we do um, short little um, surveys um, just to engage what services we're offering, how how much they, um, you know, what we could do better. So we're being able to pick up extra services or different things that we're, we've been missing out on. Um, I think that's an area that we could definitely improve in. Um, all, all the time we're looking for places we can improve in um, and just keeping up that quite often because it's offered to us we don't necessarily ask maybe as much as we should um but because we're always receiving that feedback you know on a daily basis emails reviews um and and word of mouth you know that's a major part of our business yep number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast-growing business um know who you're selling to uh and adjust your strategy accordingly so remember that you're not the client (laughs) and so don't try and assume what you would use and your opinions and pay. I mean that old chestnut. Yeah. yeah people yeah. just thinking, Oh, well, I wouldn't pay that. I or, wouldn't pay that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or I wouldn't do that. And yep. I mean, there's some of the things that uh, I offer as a service that I'm really, really passionate about, but I want to do it with my dog. So I haven't, I wouldn't necessarily pay the service. I mean, as I get busier, the, I don't get to do it as much as my dog, but you know, it's got nothing to do with me. It's, it's, that's a different, uh, that my client is not me. So just really trying to remember, um, you know, my own beliefs or my own values is mine and my clients are different. So really understanding that and understanding that lifetime value of a customer. Um, so it's great to get advertising and get new clients in, but if you're not looking after them, you're not retaining them, then you're just wasting your money. Yep. Um, so we've got clients that have been coming for 10 years and the, some of the reasons they only stop is because they, the dog passes away. Yeah. So it's quite often they'll come for 10 years, their dog might pass away and they'll have a bit of grieving time and then they'll come back with the new puppy. Right. So, yeah. you know, that sort of client loyalty is what you want. There's no point just taking a dog in for, you know, a couple of days daycare. That's great. And we want to be able to help that, but we really want to be able to help these people long-term to actually fit in with their life. Yep. Um, and then as far as the technical stuff, Google my business is great, you know, mm. making sure you're always using posts and, and photos and, and doing that um, is really good. But I also recommend getting someone that knows about marketing. We've been pretty lucky that pretty much all our marketing is based on word of mouth, Facebook, um, and, yeah, sharing that sort of social experience. Yep. Um, but, yeah, I think always getting some advice is really good. Yep. How did you fund your business apart from earning at the cafe? Did you have, have you taken on investors or bank finance or got grants over the years? Um, no, I haven't actually. The only sort of bit of finance I had was probably at the end of 2008. I'd been running the business for yeah almost 12 months and I was running out of my little 1982 Holden Gemini. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've throw the dogs in the back seat, put their seatbelts on and, and cruise around and it sort of got to the point where the dogs were getting more and bigger and we realised, um, I realised that my little Gemini was probably not going to suffice for much longer. So I needed to invest in buying my first van. Um, I had the cash, but at that stage I knew about cash flow and I didn't want to spend my cash buying capital. Yep. I was also 19 and uh, <laughs> wasn't one to uh, have much ability to get finance. So I was lucky enough to be able to hit up my dad for a $10,000 loan. <laughs> Good. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks dad. Uh, so he, uh, yeah, he, 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 spot that for me um, for a few months so until I could pay him back with interest, of course. Um, and then I think when I originally started, I put in an application for a credit, $10,000 credit card. And so just so I could pay some of the insurances and bills yep. and just keep that cash, you mm-hmm. know, for, for when I needed it. Um, and I received the letter and it was said, congratulations, you've been approved for your low rate interest, um, low interest rate credit card. And I was like, yes. And then it said credit limit. 
five hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and and I was like, yeah. okay, my first bill was seven hundred and fifty dollars, so that wasn't really going to help. Yeah. Um. So yeah, at that stage, being nineteen, having no assets, no no money, really, um, it wasn't it wasn't something that I could do. So my strategy was to start off small and, and sort of just um, built, and then from then I've always just understood the importance of cash flow so yep. just because there's cash in the bank doesn't mean i can spend yep. it no. um so keeping that and then self-funding and, and keeping yep. the money for rainy days you know yep that's great if you funded pretty much all through profits that's yeah mm. that's that's great you know if you were to start up today with plenty of funding would you go into your industry yeah, I absolutely would. Um, but knowing the amount of barriers that I had from age and lack of funding, um, I think if I knew what I knew now and went back in, I would go in at a really high level with lots of funding and smash it, you know, yeah. buy a big property, being able to take it, to scale it to uh, the level that I've finally been able to get to and bigger, but much faster. And would you take investors on to make that uh, possible to go big bang? Um, potentially if that's what were required, depend, I guess, depending on what I needed to, what funding I needed, what I had, if I yep. could do it by myself, I'm always one, like I'm happy to take on that, but I also like to, um, I guess maybe be in control. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a common trait of business yeah. owners. Yeah. Yeah. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? Oh, well, I've got a few, but I've picked one. Um, and I would say probably the toughest time in my business was like late 2013, 2014, where I was experiencing rapid growth. Um, and we just started gone from being a itinerant business where we would just have the vans, pick up the dogs, take them for a walk to having a uh, shop front workplace, mm -hmm. just started grooming salon um, and sort of like a head, headquarters HQ. Um, and I was starting to experience burnout. Um, I was also studying. That was probably quite deep into my degree. So I was starting to experience burnout but not really recognising it. Um, and then just all of a sudden at 2 o'clock one morning, um, I woke up really ill. I had an infection in my brain um, that landed wow. me in hospital. So mm. I was in the infectious diseases ward. Um, I wasn't able to walk for a few days. And once I was able to walk, it was... a uh, a very slow process um, so the side although I recovered quite quickly as from the disease the bacteria um, it was probably about 10 days I got out of hospital however the side effects were really long-lasting so that was about six months that I had to literally um, just sleep uh, the biggest achievement of my day was being able to walk to the shower and shower myself. Wow. Um, so I sat sitting in the dark because I had severe photophobia and yep. migraines. Mm -hmm. So I'd have like tea towels wrapped around my head with sunglasses, with everything in True. the dark. Um, so I couldn't even really work on the business because yep. screens and everything were affecting yep. my, my vision. So that was the biggest moment where at that time I was, I was doing everything day to day. I had to know what was happening, when was happening, who was doing what, um, you know, that sort of controlling aspect, I guess, that I was speaking about before. Um, so this gave me no choice but to step back, let go and just trust. And yep. the moment I did, it was the first time I really ever let go. Um, and it's literally the best thing that ever happened because it made me appreciate, recognize, you know, signs of burnout, signs of stress, the importance of work-life balance, but also made me appreciate the team that I have um, and the importance of being able to step back so they can do their, not that I was micromanaging as such, but it was, gives them the responsibility. So they have ownership in the business too. Um, and then, yeah, and then from then on, we were able to grow significantly because I wasn't worried about some of those things that they'd have already taken off me. I could start working on the business. So, yeah, that so really <clears throat> sorry, yeah, I was going to ask you, yeah, how did the business go in that six months if you were pretty much out of action? It, it was it in jeopardy at all or did it actually no they they absolutely killed it my team yep. were amazing and that's that's the thing i guess that's why people are so important um yep. to have a great team they you know of course there was times where like i'm not really sure what to do and at the same time it was at those points where although i've always had good systems and procedures uh there was a lot just in my head <laughs> yep. and when my head wasn't really working um then it was you know they knew 
<clears throat> we have always had really strong values and we really had strong vision. So they knew what would Rhiannon do, what yep. do we want to achieve, and they were able to just take it full on and, and do it. So and it sounds like they stepped up for you yeah. as well. Mm. Yeah, 100%. Right. Yep, they stepped up. So it's amazing. So I think that was one of the most stressful points, but one of the most, um, I guess, enlightening and eye opening. Yep. Have you read Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Workweek? Yes, yes. Yeah, there's a, there's a bit in there where he, uh, he goes to, he was pretty much having a breakdown and he went to, sorry, yeah, he was burning out. He went to London, he's based in America, went to London for a month to hang out with a mate, I think. As soon as he pretty much got off the plane, he had a breakdown and was out of action for something like six months and decided to travel Europe and pretty mm. much, you know, only checked his emails for an hour on a Monday, I think it was. And he mm. said, and I got back and the business had almost doubled without, mm. me, you know. Yeah. And that's kept pretty much what we had. We didn't just maintain um, what we had. We were growing while I wasn't there. And that was the point of going, well, how arrogant am I? Do I think that I'm the only person that can make this happen? It's like, yes, I might be the driving force behind it, but I'm a service-based business. My team are the, the drivers here. Yes. The and, ones and, that do. and it shows you that you can step away from some of the minutiae, the detail and the lower value stuff because really all the value and the growth is in marketing and mm. you can then spend more of your time on sales and marketing. Yeah, yeah, that's it. What area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? Staffing, definitely. Um, creating culture, working with staff, growing, sharing the vision, the values. Um, so it's been, I guess, well, you know, the most challenging at times, but I think it is the most valuable and what, what is the most important, especially I think in any business, but especially in a service-based business. Yeah. I like to say uh, people are the hardest thing in small business and mm -hmm. where the value is at. Yep. That's it. And that's a hundred percent right. And I think just understanding. And I think what I like to do is I've only ever had the other one other job. So I like to hire people that can do what I do way better than I can do it. Um, you know, I'm only 31 years old at the moment. Yep. I don't have huge life experience, but I, in my 31 years, I have shoved a lot of experience in there. <laughs> However, um, a lot of people have heaps of other experience that they can sort of bring to the team as well. So I think that's something that I've always really respected and admired and, and not been opposed and, and encouraged someone to step up and, and be better than me. Yeah. And what have you enjoyed least about managing the fast growth? Um, I kind of guess it's a similar type thing is potentially the staff, uh, yeah. mm. when it's, it's, it's hard, it's challenging, but it's really powerful, but it's also difficult and something that can be quite stressful because it's not black and white, it's people. Yes. Um, so, you know, even when you think that you're doing the right thing, it might not be the right thing for that person. And it's just, I guess it's a skill set that no business person, well, not no business person, but People think, oh, I'm not in HR. And I said when I went to university, oh, I'm not, I'm not into all that. Yep. But when you're in business, you don't have a choice. That's what <laughs> That's you right. do. It's your so, job. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, a lot of, a majority of my job is a HR and managing people and the same yep. as my ops manager. So, um, you know, learning to actually learn about it, understand it, you know, read organisational um, behaviour sort of um, books and, yes. and learn from people mm -hmm. like that. What do you love most about growing a small business? Um, I think the challenge, the flexibility, um, the excitement, um, you know, just everything to, that can be, <laughs> it's, it's not mundane. There's a yep. difference. There's a change every single day, um, I think. And I think having the flexibility to be able to do what I want to do to travel, I've been able to travel o around um, the world overseas quite a lot. I've been able to do a degree. Um, I've been able to, you know, my partner lives interstate. He followed his career a couple of years ago, he moved interstate. Um, so I've been able to work interstate to do that. So I think that's what I enjoy the most. Yeah. What has been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? Um, I it's, think, like it's like a test, isn't it? Yeah, I think I would say let it go, step back, trust in your employees and advise and get advisors to help you. Um, the moment you stop trying to control everything is the moment you grow. And, mm -hmm. and most of the time businesses will grow and the only thing stopping them is 
the person behind it, um, yep. you know, limiting that through their own beliefs or their own fears or whatever it might be. So, you know, I think that's the biggest thing, just understanding, you know, building that, valuing what's important, the great team, the great culture, um, and then, um, yeah, letting go. Yeah, good. What's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? Uh, trust your gut. Like, I think that is the most important thing for me. Um, you know what needs to happen. You know, deep down, your intuition. Um, your gut is more complex than your brain, so use it. <laughs> um, every decision that I make in business calculates risk, finance, everything. But ultimately, um, I consider, does it feel right? How yeah. does it feel? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, not saying that I ignore everything else and only go on the touchy-feely, how does it feel? Mm -hmm. um, but after considering all those options, even if all those options are looking at this certain way, but my gut's like, mm, nah. Yeah. Um, so I think 100% trust your gut. Do you love talking small business growth with other owners? We have a vibrant online community from many industries around the world. Plus, we regularly add new tools and resources for community members and host two webinars a month to help you grow your small business. GrowSmallBusiness.com Can you talk to how you added people to the team, some wins, mistakes and advice for those listening? Yeah, um, I think generally putting people in the team. So I always... Uh, my manager and I sort of have a bit of a joke about we when we interview people, we go we sit sit down, have an informal chat and go measure it. Could we have a beer with this person? Yep. You know, is this person on our level? Does it represent what we, if we were in a pub together, would we have the same conversations, the same values, the same interests? Um, because they're sort of people that we need on the team. Um, everyone, although because it is a small business, we need everyone to have um, that that want, that drive, that passion, that ownership. Um, so we do, when recruiting, we really base it a lot about our values. We yeah. have a lot of values that we don't just pin on the wall. We, mm. we practice every day. Yep. Um, so everything is to that. Do, do you fit in? Do you value what we value? And if they do, then if they've got no experience, it doesn't matter. You know, yep. most of that stuff can be learnt and understood <clears throat> Yeah, I say in recruitment, I, I hire for attitude and aptitude. If they're a smart yeah. person and they're not an arsehole, not mm -hmm. toxic, they've got a good attitude, you know, you can give them that experience. Have you heard of the airport rule? No. Someone mentioned this on a cast recently. Basically, if you're stuck in an airport on stopover, your flight's mm -hmm. delayed like five hours, could you spend that five hours with that team member yeah. and just hang out and not get annoyed by them, basically? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's uh, I guess it's, it's similar to the uh, uh, having a beer together rule. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Any, uh, any mistakes or other advice for uh, around people because it's so important in business? I think the biggest mistake is don't be desperate. Yep. Um, I Gosh. think any any mistakes that I've made is because we're so short staffed and, and yep. we do have a shortage in this industry um, of skilled staff and quality staff. So, you know, when you're going through rapid growth, you go, oh, I've just got to get bums on seats. I just need yep. someone. But you pay and, for it. Mm. Yeah. And sometimes, and especially, you know, a toxic person can be like cancer. It just spreads through yep. an organisation. So my biggest word of advice is you're better off uh, managing or moving or somehow working with your growth and not take a person on that you don't, doesn't fit and mm -hmm. give in your gut and your your beer test or airport test or whatever yep. sort of way um, than taking it on and just hoping for the best. Yeah. What are some things you'd recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? Um, values is, I guess, our big thing because to me that's just what's important. Um, you know, we have values like self-care we have values like um dreaming big and being innovative and being accountable so if people are not representing those values then they're never going to fit in within the organization um and it's sometimes it's hard you get a couple of those people in and the culture changes and you're trying to adjust it and measure it but what i suggest is don't just have values that, you know, these cute little words that you put on the wall and whatever. Yeah. They have to mean something. They have to come into your day-to-day -day life. So every morning we do a team huddle. Um, so it's just about 15 minutes where everyone talks about 
what they achieved yesterday, what they're going to achieve today and like in line with their values. Like if they want to look at more innovation this week, creativity, if they want to look at more accountability, you know, like sometimes I go in and I'm like, I have not done what I've said I need to do (laughs) three days in a row. Now you guys have to hold me accountable. So we, you know, we hold each other accountable. um, And I think that that's what breeds a good culture because it makes it, people appreciate and to be able to approach you when there's a a situation. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, The vision and values, the godfather of that really uh, was late eighties. I think they published the book, maybe early nineties was Jim Collins built to last. I'm not sure if you've read that book. No, I haven't, but I'll definitely put on my list. Phenomenal book. And it starts out with a very dry, (laughs) very dry statistical study of basically takes 21 companies that are just amazing. And then they've got each has a comparison company. So Boeing versus McDonnell Douglas, the airlines. And they do this big study to show that the comparison companies outperformed their stock index, whichever country they're in, like fivefold over a 40 year period or 50 year period. But the, the, the wow. company that they're compared to, the, the phenomenal company, has outperformed them 10 times or something like that. And so they were trying to find what is it that makes that difference? Is it a charismatic leader? Is it a brilliant strategy, brilliant product? And it's none of that. I'm not going to give it away, but it's um, a really, really, really good read. Wow. Yeah, definitely. I'll definitely have Go straight and his, that. And his follow-up book, um, Good to Great, after that, another five years later, because I, again, did a whole lot of studies on it, um, is also one of my favourites. Tell our audience how you've handled balance. Um, ooh, well, I, I, it's about trust, I guess. It's the same thing, about learning to trust in my team and remembering you only live once. Yep. Like, you only have one shot. Like, this is just it. So... Um, I make the conscious effort to remove feelings of guilt because I always feel guilty. Like if I'm off, someone else is working and, you know, the rest of the team don't feel like that. You know, if they've got a day off, they don't. So I try and, you know, make sure removing those feelings of guilt. Um, and I remind myself the risk and the sacrifice and the time that I've put into the building the business entitles me to have a life. Yep. Um, I gave up, sorry. No, you're right. <laughs> I was just say, I gave up much of my teens and 20s um, yep. building the business. You know, my friends would go to Europe and yep. do whatever and I'd have to go, stay home because at that point we were working 365 days a year. We used to do pet sitting. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, there was no day off. It was every single day of the year. So um, I think it's just understanding and justifying that you deserve it and giving yourself permission and making it work. Yeah, I certainly struggled with that. Let go and stop working and mm. celebrate what you've achieved and successes mm. and take some time out. But you know, I'm, I still work on it, but I'm yeah. much better these days than I was when I started in business 20 years ago. Yeah, and it takes time. And especially because if you are an entrepreneur, like you're always working. You, yep. It is like even when I go uh, pre-COVID times, I was trying to take a couple of trips overseas a year, one big trip, one small trip. Yeah. Um, even though that's a holiday and I'm doing holiday stuff, I'm always learning and looking and seeing how this could apply or reading or podcasts or, you know, that's what you're, it's what you do when you're an entrepreneur. So yeah. just trying to find a balance of where you can actually, you know, be around friends, family, um, you know, being able to find that balance to work from places that are not at work um, and, and, and be on the business rather than just in it. Yep. Yeah. How much professional development did you invest in yourself over the years? Um, well, I think heaps. And even initially, before I even started the business, I went and did, you know, a cert four in small business. And then straight away, as soon as I started the business, started a bachelor's degree. Um, I'm currently now doing a cert four in training and assessment. Um, they're all formal qualifications, but I do lots and lots of informal stuff too. So I think there's always room for upgrading skills it's something that we encourage in our culture um you know within the team that we do a lot of in-house training encourage other people to teach and learn from each other um yeah and i think if you're not if you're not learning and you're not growing you're dying yes (laughs) so yeah i love that henry ford quote anyone who stops learning is old yeah that's that's i love it have you had mentors or coaches along the way you can talk to Yeah, yeah, I have. So I sort of see it as formal and informal mentors. One of my formal mentors is Matt Bullock. He's um, CEO of a company called Spinify. Um, And he's mentored me for many years. We sort of met on an informal basis. He was a young family and and a neighbour of mine walking his dog. 
um, new baby and the dog was just pulling and pulling and pulling. So I managed to go and help him be able to get uh, Harper, his little beagle, walking next to the, the pram. Right. Um, and then we, yeah, sort of started talking and, and realising we had a shared passion for business. Um, at the time, he was founder and CEO of eWay, a payment gateway company. Massive. Um, mm. Yeah. So since then, he sold that and moved on to his new venture, which is doing really, really well. Um, so I've been had, oh, sorry, I've had a lot of time and experience being able to share his knowledge, um, being such a big business owner, but also having um, so much experience. So the good thing about Matt is even though I was just a little dog walker kid down the road, uh, he never saw me as that. He yep. saw me as a business person. Yeah. Um, so, you know, took me under his wing and was able to help me set up some, you know, IT systems, his background being in IT and everything, some website systems and 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 a- enabled me to sort of grow and understand that I wasn't just a dog walker or yep. a, a kid. I was, you know, I was a business person. And once you, it took me a long time to believe that, but, yeah. um, you know, you kind of half do, but not really. And so you get these mentors that actually make you, you know, help you really believe in yourself. So yeah, he was sort of really good. Um, my other sort of mentor that really got me started was my year 11 business teacher who, mm-hmm. uh, Damien Headley, who unfortunately since has passed away. Um, but he, yeah, like we used to clash <laughs> yeah. really, really bad. So he was the only teacher that I've experienced that really believed in me. Um, yep. I wasn't, I had quite a few experiences at school where most teachers were either kicking me out of their class or suspending me for questioning or <laughs> <laughs> talking back or whatever it might be. Um, and the good thing about Damien is he would the same thing. You know, I, I didn't want to do the competition. He's mm. like, well, you, well, I don't really care. Like, you yep. know, you're, you're doing it. And the reason he's like, and the reason you're doing it because I can see you're not confident right now yep. and you need that push. And I know you don't want to, and I know you're going to fight me about it, but I don't really care. So (laughs) I don't give a shit (laughs) doing it. Yeah, you don't don't give a shit. And he was, you know, he was pretty blunt like that. And it was really good because it was like, you know, it it was an informal, um, formal context of teaching. But at the same time, he knew what I needed. He knew that I just didn't have enough, you know, yeah, and belief. Um, So he sort of did it and it was great. Do you have a board of directors or advisors? No, just me. Um, but I do um, work, I've been working closely with ACT government advising on some of the legislative changes and um, in the industry for the animal welfare bill that was introduced and also working with them drafting codes of practice for the industry um, and also in the process of working with skill standards um, in relation to um, training packages and frameworks within the industry too. Yep. All right, Rhiannon, we're on to our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? Uh, I think the hardest thing is the sacrifices you make and letting go. Um, you know, it, it's great when you, when you get there, but there's a lot of long hours, lack of remuneration, um, at times and, you know, difficulties managing people and, you know, having to say no or learning to say no. Um, so my word of advice is business is, you know, amazing and it's great and it's well worth a sacrifice if you know your why. Um, Yep. If you know your purpose and what drives you, the challenges and sacrifices are just, you know, small bumps in the road. Um, yeah. If you don't know where you're headed, your direction and why you're doing it, uh, they can be quite detrimental and, and, and potentially yep. not worth it, not worth the challenge and sacrifice. Yeah, the powerful Simon Sinek TED Talk video, one of the top, mm, yeah. know your why, yep. one of the top 10 TED Talk videos of all time. Yeah, yeah my, one of my faves. Yep. And um, favourite business book which has helped you the most? Uh, so many and it's hard when I, when I thought about it, I'm like, oh, I can't even pin it down. But I always go back to seven habits of highly effective people. Yep. Um, Stephen, Stephen Covey. Covey. Yep. yep. Um, I just, and for our work, like, same sort of stuff. I just always flick between, but I do lots of different reading on, I like biographies. I think learning about people's lives is always really important. Helps with the people aspect. Um, so yeah, I think there's just so many. <laughs> Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? Yeah, lots of those. Um, look, love this podcast. Um, same, love bi- biographies and learning about other people's lessons and experiences. Um, Unstoppable with Kerwin Ray is pretty good. He's, you know, always chats to a few different people, which is great. Jane Ellis from Boost Juice, um, Superwomen We Ain't. 
mm-hmm. How I Built This, Guy Ross, and um, The Canine Paradigm with Gwen Cook and Pat Stewart. So it's a dog-related podcast, but it's always got some good um, people and business-type uh, stuff in there as well. Right. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? Uh, good accounting software and systems and processes. So Absolutely. Mm. When I started, I thought I was only a dog walker and had my little, you know, cash invoice yep. book and all of a sudden blew out and mm. it took me a really big time and challenge to get that all into a system because it was really, really complex. So, you know, my word of advice would, you know, pay experts that offer you those expert services, get them to set it all ask up and ask for help. Um, I see you know, businesses trying to do it all themselves. Um, and I think it's just best to, to leave things to the experts that the experts can set up so you can concentrate on what's important. Yep, that's right. And what, out of interest, what accounting software do you use? I use zero. So oh, I started great. Good when... Good answer. Yeah, I used... I started uh, like when, when I went from my good old Excel spreadsheet and pieces of paper... To my... To, to my ob and it was clunky and then mum who was doing my book book work I was doing my book work and so and it was this dodgy file that just moved and I just it just didn't feel natural to me so I spent a lot of money tried to get it to work and it just didn't and then the moment zero came in online Jumped, yeah. Yeah, Craig Winkler is the founder of Maya in the early 80s. He's a Kiwi actually and obviously that really took off after GST came in. Mm. But he sold out of Maya probably 10 years ago and mm. started pouring money into zero soon after it launched. Um, yeah. So that's a big sign. Yeah, some investment wankers bought Maya and it's, I, in my opinion totally fucked that business up. They're mm. you know, dragged into the cloud kicking and screaming and it's a terrible piece of software. But anyway, yeah. don't start me on that rant. <laughs> All right, final and my favourite question. What would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? Um, I guess same sort of thing with systems and procedures. Um, Set them up according to where you want to go and the size you want to be, not where you are now. Um, You know, if you plan to build an empire, build the foundations before the walls go up, not up. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, good. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for your time today, Rhiannon. I think the audience will get a shit ton of value out of that and really enjoy your journey and spectacular success, not just financially, but also what you've done with the team and your customers and obviously all those dogs and pets. Mm. Um, So yeah, thank you for your time today. No worries. Thanks so much for um, having me part of the podcast. No worries. That's it. Thanks for listening. Please leave a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. It means more small business owners will find our cast and help people with their business growth journey.